Simon Max Hit the Road began development at the LucasArts Entertainment Company in 1992, during a time period many gamers would look back fondly on as the golden age of adventure games. Employing much of the team behind Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, another iconic LEC classic, Hit the Road was the second collaborative effort between Steve Purcell, Colette McCod, Mike Stimley, and Sean Clark, a veritable dream team of LucasArts point-and-click superstars, and the first video game adaptation of Purcell's Dog and Rabbit Detectives, taking cues from the 1989 Simon Max story, On the Road. There's a lot of trust involved, and um, and the more the, the the more the team you feel that they know the characters, the more confident you feel. So, in this case, you know Mike Stanley was a comics fan, and, and Sean Clark knew the characters already. So, um, and I was in the building the whole time. I was just trying to spread myself as thinly as possible and do some animation, and you know do some writing and and uh, do some background. So I was just trying to be around as much as possible and I just felt confident with that group and sure enough uh, I think we pulled it off. Yeah, uh, and, and it's one of those things where I think as time goes on people remember it better than, I, it's sort of a heretical notion, but I think people remember it even better than it actually was uh, because as funny as it was and as absolutely gorgeous as it was and as good as a lot of the puzzles were. There are some puzzles that I look back now and, and go, oh man, we were really just trying to punish the player with this one, weren't we? Uh, you know, the whole extendy arm with the hand on the end of it to uh, get in the giant ball of twine is like, oh, that's that's hard, man. And we didn't, and it's not like today where we've got, you know, a hint system backing us up to actually kind of continuously throw hints at you to help you through the game. It's like, nope, you don't get it, you're stuck. And, and you didn't have a web page out there for you to go look up the actual answers, you kind of had to talk to people or go to some kind of obscure bulletin board someplace to find out the answers. Um, but I, yeah, I'm obviously very happy with, you know, the reception of it and how people have kind of grown to love it over the years. It's very, makes me very happy. You know, there's always stuff you wish you could go back and, and do over again, and so there's always little things that you look at. Oh man, I wish we could have a little bit more time for that. But ultimately, the the reception from the fans was so great that you know, and and once some time passes, then you you can kind of look at your work and and uh, not worry about it so much. Hit the Road's 1993 release was met with universal acclaim and quickly earned it a place in the Point and Click Hall of Fame. With many gamers toting the duo's cross-country exploits as an archetypal example of adventure gaming done right, the fans, of course, demanded more. I wish that came close to fruition on two separate occasions. 2001 saw the announcement of Sam and Max Plunge Through Space, an ill-fated action-adventure starring Purcell's freelance police, and developed by Infinite Machine, an equally ill-fated startup born of former LucasArts employees. Unfortunately, Infinite Machine went bankrupt within a year of the game's initial announcement, dooming the game to obscurity. However, Sam and Max Faithfuls hardly had a chance to lament, as 2002 saw the announcement of Sam and Max Freelance Police. A fully 3D point-and-click adventure game spearheaded by members of the original Hit the Road team, and along with Full Throttle 2, Hell on Wheels, part of LucasArts' planned adventure genre revival. Freelance Police uh, was going to be a point-and-click 3D adventure game. Um, there was a lot of time in six chapters. Um, that's pretty much all I can really say about it, as far as the actual story. But. Um, yeah, and there was talk near the end of we could we could do this episodically, we could sell it episodically, and the you know we just I don't know the market hadn't quite matured to the point where we could pull it off, uh, and then the company went another direction as they say euphemistically. <laughs> yeah, Sam and Max Freelance Police. Uh, it was great because I was um, working with Mike Stemley again, and uh, of course he knows the characters really well, and we worked out kind of an epic saga that we were going to break up into shorter pieces and uh, and of course you know those guys were carrying the weight of the project on their backs and I was coming in and getting to consult along the way and I would do some character designs and things like that and it felt like the project was progressing in a really good way and uh, Mike had a really good handle on it and I was loving the animations that were coming out and they would send me you know, files all the time that were fun to, to see. It was like getting a little present every day to kind of see what was up. It was on March 3rd, 2004, that LucasArts canceled production on Simon Max Freelance Police. Fans were furious, bombarding LucasArts with emails, phone calls, and letters regarding Simon Max's doomed resurrection. The cry for the canceled sequel peaking at SaveSimonMax.com, where a petition for the revival of Freelance Police garnered over 32,000 signatures. 
so much time had passed since there had been a, a major Sam and Max project. Um, it was actually really surprising that there were so many people that were so invested in having this game come out. And so it's sort of, it was like they were the surrogates for me. I didn't even have a chance to respond that much. And, uh, and suddenly there was this outcry, which was, was actually very gratifying. I think there was a major shift at LucasArts at the time, and, um, and that's kind of, it was one of those projects that was in, in process when the shift happened, so I think that was the, the reason why um, they stopped work on it. Full-scale adventure games, even by then, were getting economically unfeasible because you could sell you know, ex the same amount you always could, but they were getting way expensive to make because, you know, the 3D tools hadn't, you know, the 3D tools for making them hadn't matured enough, and, you know, they all had these cinematic cutscenes, blah, 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 and events. So you can see why, you know, given I'm going to make it, you know, given the choice between making an adventure game that's going to, I know can sell this much if it's good, and I could build this game with a, an action-adventure 3D shooter game of some sort that, if it's okay, might sell five times as much and cost about the same, eh, I may go with that for now. So the, the adventure genre was waiting for a new way to uh, uh, market the games, I think. I mean, I don't know too much about the numbers stuff.